Hello, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret, continuing our verse by verse study through the book of Psalms and through the Bible. We come today to Psalm 107, and we will pick it up in verse 17. Psalm 107, verse 17. Open your Bible to that spot in Scripture and get ready to follow along as we study it verse by verse. Can't emphasize that enough. I try to, but uh, it's so important that you look at the Word of God. You get used to looking at your Bible and, and that you get used of it and that you're reading it for yourself, if it's at all possible. Nothing wrong with listening to it. That's fine. But if you can, read your Bible as we study verse by verse. That's the best way by far because the Bible is the most important thing. So anyway, while you're getting your Bible, I'm going to remind you very quickly of the Scripture Verse by Verse website that's found at thebibleversebyverse.com. You are going to love that website if you love the Word of God. Now, if you're interested in psychology, psychobabble, psychotherapy, uh, how-to books, 12 steps to this, 12 steps to that, save your, save your effort. Don't even go there. You're not going to get it there. You can, buy, you can get that stuff at any Christian bookstore. Uh, you can get that stuff at most modern churches. It's a dime a dozen. It's all over the place. But if you just want the pure Word of God, verse by verse, 66 books of the Bible, just the Word of God, which was sufficient for over 2,000 years, until Freud came along, evidently, and Christians brought, bought into it, I have the sufficient Word of God at thebibleversebyverse.com. I believe it. If I didn't believe it, I wouldn't be teaching it for over 30 years. And plus, I believe it because God says so. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Listen to this. And is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly equipped for every good work. There's no wiggle room there. God believes in the sufficiency of Scripture. That is all you need. Don't let, don't let anybody sell you how-to books. Don't let anybody sell you 12 steps to this or 12 steps to that. Tell them to take a hike because you believe in the sufficiency of Scripture. Jesus did. Paul did. I do. Father, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Psalm 107, verse 17. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. And nothing is more foolish than sin. Nothing is more foolish than wickedness. Just think about it. Not only does it offend the Creator, not only does it offend the sustainer of life, the provider of all things, the one who holds the very atoms of your body together, not only does it offend him, not only does it offend our judge, but it also hurts the sinner themselves. Pour yourself a cool glass of gasoline and drink it. And you will quickly understand how gasoline is not meant to be drunk. It's not meant, it's unnatural for us to drink. And therefore it hurts us. You'll find that out in a hurry. And committing sin is like drinking gasoline. It's not meant for us. And therefore it's going to cause suffering. 17 and 18. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, are afflicted. Their soul abhorreth all manner of food, and they draw near unto the gates of death. 
and the Bible, of course, is correct here, as it always is in every place. When a person is suffering bad, when a, ser when a person draw draws close to death, the body begins to shut down, and they don't even have an appetite. I remember, you know, my dad died when he was 82. My mom was 85. No, no, she was 83 when he died. And he was dying cancer, and his body was shutting down, and he was, <clears throat> he was already in hospice and at home. And my mom just kept trying to give him his favorite food. His favorite food was usually mashed potatoes and gravy. He loved mashed potatoes and gravy. And he did eat some of that, but other than that, he didn't eat nothing. He didn't, he didn't want to eat anything, and my mom felt so bad because she couldn't get him to eat. She just thought that she could maybe make him a little healthy and prolong his life, but his body was shutting down. He just didn't want it anymore. And that's how it is, you know. When we live a wicked life, when we sin, we sin. Our, our spirits and our soul and our body, they're not healthy. And we lose our appetite. When we start suffering the trials that are caused by sin. So notice verse 19. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of their distresses. When you are so low that you can't go any lower, when you are lower than a snake's belly in a gravel pit, you can't possibly get any lower than what you are. That's when you need to cry out to God. When you have no answers and you know you've been stupid, you know you've been foolish, that's when you need to cry out to God with humility. And as he was talking about in the previous verse, when sickness or worry or some other cause or consequence of sin begins to take away our appetite for even food, even our favorite food, that is our cue to have an appetite for prayer. And God does not despise the prayers of one who is in deep distress. The important thing is that we pray. 20. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Remember the centurion who came to Jesus and said, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. Remember when he said that? That's how powerful God's word is. It is the most powerful thing on earth when it is read, when it is meditated on, when it is spoken, when it is studied, when it is lived, when it is prayed. There is nothing more powerful than God's word. Speak but the word and my servant will be healed. God's word does not come back to him void. There's power in every letter. 21. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. He's been saying this quite a bit lately. Even more amazing than God's wonderful works. Even more amazing than God's goodness to undeserving sinners is that so many, after experiencing God's amazing goodness, fail to say thank you to God. Just common courtesy for the things that he has done. Like he owes you it or something, or that's his job, and you don't have to give him thanks. That indifference is more amazing than God's answers to prayers. More amazing in a bad way. Sort of like the ten, and if you don't think that bothers God, it bothers God. Like the ten lepers that Jesus healed. Only one returned, remember? The nine never even returned to say thank you. They had an incurable disease that Jesus cured with a, with a word. And one measly leper came back the ten ungrateful wretches went their merry way, lived their lives without leprosy, and never said thank you. 
And it bothered Jesus because he even said, he's where are the other nine? There were 10 of you healed. Where's the other nine? You're the only one? And he appreciated that guy who came back to say thank you. Which means he'll appreciate you if you don't fail to say thank you to him. Be the one out of 10. You know, that's probably a pretty close ratio. And it's probably not even that high. But be the one, be the one exception who doesn't take God for granted, who says thank you, and he'll notice and he'll appreciate it. And anything we can do to make God feel appreciated is worth doing because we do so many things that are wrong in his eyes. So notice verse 22. And let them sacrifice the sacrifice of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. See, that's what I was talking about. Sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving. That means offer God thanksgiving even when you don't necessarily feel like it. That's what a sacrifice is. A sacrifice is giving God something that you that kind of is tough to give. Anybody can thank God when times are good. Thank God and praise God and worship God when times are bad. You're giving them something then. And notice verse 22. One more time. Let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. It's good to say thank you to God with words. It's also good to say thank you with gifts. And it's also good to say thank you to God with sacrificial works. And thank offerings can come in many forms today. Give God something that you've been hanging on to. Out of appreciate, give God something that costs you something. Give God something that goes beyond your comfort level. Give God something that is a sacrifice for you to give. He deserves it. 23. They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters. Sailors were in view here. And sailors actually were the astronauts of that day. They really were. The seas were unknown, full of mystery and full of legend, and all sorts of fanciful tales. And so they were unknown. So those who sailed the seas were heroes. You know, they were the Charles Lindbergh. They were the John Glenn. They were the Alan Shepherds. They were the Neil Armstrong, the Apollo 11s of their day. But even those heroes felt small on the oceans because that's where they saw just how big God is. Boy, those oceans are huge and those waves are humongous. And God made them and God controls them, that tells you a little bit something about the size of God, doesn't it? Verse 24. It says, These see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. Yeah, one thing you can see in the middle of nowhere is a lot of stars. The sailors navigated the seas by the stars. And they knew there was no doubt about it in their mind. They knew there was, they knew there was a God up there who gave them the stars so that they wouldn't get lost. There was a God of order who put everything into place so that they wouldn't get lost, so that they could navigate where they were going by the stars. They saw the works of the Lord in the middle of the ocean. You don't even have to get out that far. 25. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves thereof. Still talking about those guys out on the sea and some of their experiences. I wonder how many billions of prayers have been prayed by sailors in the midst of stormy seas. I would, I would guess that anyone who might happen to be a professing atheist would probably think there ought to be a God for situations like this, and they'd probably pray to him. 26, they mount up to the heavens, they go down again to the depths, their soul is melted because of the trouble. You'd have to be insane 
not to be afraid of waves that are larger than your ship. You'd have to be insane not to pray when you see those waves coming your way. People in situations like that know in their heart. They don't have to be instructed. They, they, they know in their heart that there is a big God who can help them. And that's why they pray. Do you see how instinctive it is for us to believe in a God? Do you see how hard it is for people to become atheists? If they truly are atheists, they have worked against the testimony of the Holy Spirit. They have worked against the testimony of creation. They have worked against the built-in knowledge that we have when we we're born that there is a God out there. You got to work hard. You got to really love your sin and fear God's wrath to talk yourself into believing that there's no God out there. And yet so many of those professing atheists will pray in tough situations. 27, they reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are, and are at their wit's end. Then they cry out to the Lord in their trouble and he bringeth them out of their distresses. And talk about God's grace, huh? People can be too stressed out to talk. People can be so stressed out that they can't even think. And yet God gives them the grace to be able to pray. And maybe it's not a fancy prayer. Maybe it's not eloquent. Maybe it's just one screaming word, but he hears it because those are fervent prayers. Verse 29, he maketh the storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still. No, you know that no one but God can do that, right? Because that's what it's saying here. God makes the storms to calm. The waves are still. Nobody, nobody but God can storm, uh, calm stormy seas. That's why when Jesus did it, not once but twice, his apostles knew that he wasn't just a man. Not when he did that one. If there were any doubts in his mind, in their mind, about who Jesus was, that took care of it. Verse 30. Then are they glad because they are quiet. So he bringeth them into their desired haven. So he's talking about the sailors who, you know, they were glad when sea, sea grew calm. They prayed to God. Sea got calm. They were glad. And that's because nobody appreciates good times more than the one who God has brought through bad times. It's true. Nobody appreciates calmness more than the one that has been brought through chaos by God. Verse 31. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. There it is again. He keeps saying that, doesn't he? When a person prays to God for help and God gives them what they need, they should be as quick to say thank you as they were to pray in the first place. It's only common courtesy, right? People are, people are courteous courteous to, to other people oftentimes, but they're so rude to God. They don't treat him with the same common courtesy. Verse 32, let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. In other words, give thanks before people. That's important to God, that we give thanks to him in front of people. It is a duty. But you know, it's also a privilege to tell others about God's goodness after he brings us through a tough situation. It is unthinkable. If somebody rescues you from a tough situation, it would be unthinkable to take the credit for that yourself or to ignore what somebody has done. I mean, you want to tell people, you know, what that fella did for you, how he brought you through. And that's, that's what, how we should treat God too. When he brings you through a tough situation, don't be ashamed to tell others 
that it was God who got you through? Yeah, it's a duty, and it should be a duty, but it's also a privilege to talk about God. God has chosen you to talk about Him. That is an honor. And a grateful person will consider it to be an honor to speak of God's kindness and God's faithfulness. 33. He turneth rivers into a wilderness, and the water springs into dry ground. When the Lord wants to get sinful man's attention, he can take away those things that they take for granted. Or have you noticed that? When God wants to get our attention, he has a good way of doing that. Just take away something that you've taken for granted. Things like maybe fresh water, or maybe the ability to enjoy basic things. God knows how to get our attention. 33 and 34, he turned rivers into the wilderness and water springs into dry ground, a fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of those who dwell therein. You know, when you look for the root cause of sorrow, you will find sin every single time. It will either be our sin, it will either be our personal sin, or someone else's sin, or the sin principle that has entered the world with Adam's transgression and the fall of man. But at the root of every single cause of sorrow, you will find sin. 35. He turneth the wilderness into a pool of water, and dry ground into water springs. And there he maketh the hungry to dwell, that they may prepare a city for habitation. What God removes in judgment, he can restore without any problem when he is finished disciplining his people. The Bible says that God makes up for the years that the locusts have eaten. Locusts were sometimes a sign of God's judgment in the Old Testament. And you know, God promised the Israelites, he said, if you just repent, I'll make up for the years that the locusts have eaten. Verse 37. And sow the fields and plant vineyards, which may yield fruits with increase. When God blesses man's work with productivity, when God blesses man's work with a paycheck, man is more willing to work right? Only makes sense. A paycheck or a fruitful harvest is God's reward for a day's work. God does not expect people to work for nothing. That's what communists preaches. You work hard and you give away everything that you have. That's not even biblical. That's why it's such a miserable failure, no matter where it's tried. Communism is a horrible failure. Verse 38, he blesseth them also, so that they are multiplied greatly, and permitteth not their cattle to decrease. God's blessings make people, God's blessings makes people as well as making, as well as making people happy. And what I mean by that is that he, his blessings make people, period, increased numerically, as well as blessing people in general. It is God who, who makes a couple fertile. It is God who allows people to have children. Verse 39, again, they were diminished and brought low through oppression, affliction, and sorrow. He poureth contempt upon the princes and causeth them to wander in the wilderness where there is no way. Israel's good times and bad times were a direct result of their moral character. If they were not living for God, they had terrible, they had terrible crops, 
They had locust invasions, they had drought, they had floods. Everything was ruined. They were defeated by their enemies. When they were holy, when they had good character, when they were walking with the Lord, it was the exact opposite. Everything went great. That's how it was with the nation Israel because God was Israel's king. He was their ruler of that nation in Old Testament days. And their circumstances always eventually caught up to their level of goodness or ungodliness. It was just a matter of time. And, you know, the principle is the same today. The Bible says, the Bible says, God is not mocked. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. If you sow to the Spirit, you'll reap life. If you sow to the flesh, you'll reap destruction. Totally up to us what kind of life you want. Verse 41, Yet setteth he the poor on high from affliction, and maketh their families like a rock. God can change things for the better, and he can do it in hardly no time at all. Jesus said the last will be first, and the first will be the last. Jesus said, he, blessed, are, blessed are they who weep now, for they will laugh. Verse 42, the righteous shall see it and rejoice, and all iniquity shall stop their mouth. There comes a point when the mouths of the wicked will have nothing to say. They can talk smart, laugh about God, laugh about the Word of God. They just are so sophisticated. They sit there, you know, on television, and they cross their legs, and they drink their expensive $8 cup of coffee, Oh, you know, and they're so smug and they're so sophisticated and they talk down about people who believe in God and Christians and biblical principles. I'm thinking of one famous atheist that you all would know if I named him. He has just, you know, reached the pinnacle of the business world and so sophisticated. Oh, yes, so sophisticated. But there comes a point where that man's mouth will be shut and he will have nothing to say. Because eventually, every argument against God and his holy word will fail. And at that point, those people should repent. But often they do not. You know why? It's because by that point, their hearts are so hard that instead of repenting, their pride is so strong that even though they have nothing to say, against God, they'll just climb up and not say anything. They'll never admit that they're wrong. Man, they're so far gone, they might as well die and go to hell right away. Verse 43, Whoso is wise and will observe these things, even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. It is wise to think about God. It is wise to to consider to the, the goodness of God. God has given us, mankind, an immortal soul, and the ability to think and understand, something that the animals do not have. The animals have instinct, but we have the ability to reason and think and understand, so we should use it. And if we do, we will come to the conclusion, honestly, how kind our God is, and if we know that, that should stir us up to want to please him. And it is a hard, sinful heart that can look at the kindness and the goodness and the sacrifice of God upon the cross for sinners and walk away from it and not care. For more of God's Word, go to the BibleVerseByVerse.com. I am out of time, but you can continue studying the Word of God right there with me and Please remember that you can be a part of this ministry. This is a faith ministry, which means I depend on your prayers and your financial support. So if you want to stand shoulder to shoulder with me and be a partner with me in this ministry, then pray for this ministry. Pray for me. Pray for the Word of God, please. And also click the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com. Fill yourself with the Word of God 
and then click the donate button and prayerfully give us the Lord may lead. Until next time, Michael Moret for Scripture verse by verse. So long, everyone.